to the first episode of Odd Man Front, a Sumer Sports podcast. I'm your host, Parker Fleming. Here, uh, many of you have listened along as we have uh, done some interviews over the summer and uh, very excited to get my own kind of niche here on the on the Sumer Sports podcast and have Odd Man Front every Thursday afternoon in this four o'clock Eastern window to talk a little football, talk a little stats, frankly, talk a little bit, whatever I want. I think it'll be fun kind of opportunity uh, to get into some research and talk. Make sure that you're subscribed to the Sumer Sports Show. You get Thomas Dimitrov and Eric Eager, Dr. Eric Eager on Monday and Wednesdays talking about roster construction, season trends, things that are happening in the league. And then Tuesday, you get that great episode of Stats and Scheme with uh, Tej Seth and Sean Syed, where they're going to look at how numbers and film kind of intersect to tell us more about the game of football. So really, really great lineup. Really excited that this is all coming together this fall at Sumer Sports. I feel like we've got a lot of energy there. Uh, other thing that's really cool, the Sumer Sports website, if you haven't been to it lately, it is much revamped. Very, very cool. Got league tables, got player tables, everything up there. Um, and we've got a newsletter you can subscribe to that has game previews, reviews, excitability, or watchability scores, uh, everything you could want data-wise. So sumersports.com, The Zone is where we have some articles up there, and you can uh, subscribe for the newsletter there. All of that aside, let's get to this episode here and what we want to talk about today. Very excited to bring on this guest, uh, uh, Lindsay Rhodes, uh, fantasy football uh, analyst extraordinaire, broadcaster, been an NFL network uh, currently on Sirius XM. Lindsay joins the show today. Uh, Lindsay, how are you? I'm so excited. I'm so excited about your show. I am subscribing, doing all of the things. I'm such a big fan of you, and I'm so uh, thrilled that when I threatened you after not having me on your show when we ran into each other in Vegas, you uh, felt enough pressure to reach out and ask me to come on. I'm excited to have this you conversation know, with you. Bullying, bullying works. Absolutely. I'm, I mean, I'm going to put on to that. So. Uh, <laughs> I think that's probably not the message we want to take away from this podcast. <laughs> bullying but, works. Yeah, that's no. the name of the episode. They, uh, they they are no longer a sponsor, so these words are free. They are they are they are voluntarily offered. But awesome of Circa to bring us out there. I feel like the networking I you know just people I got to meet that I had talked to online or kind of been adjacent to online and meet them in person was so great. Very very fun to do that and be out there. So uh, was was a great event. Glad we got to connect a little bit and glad that you are in fact uh, on the show now, um, Lindsay. Let's let's start a little bit talking about about you. I'm you know I'm interested. In, I want to talk about fantasy football. I want to talk about the league trends and everything. But I want to talk about you as well. Um, so you're currently doing uh, Sirius XM with with fantasy. You're uh, every every day on uh, one to three every weekday Eastern Monday time, th- get Monday to Friday one to three Eastern. Cool. Yep, fantasy dirt. Awesome. Uh, fa- yes, fantasy dirt. That's I couldn't remember the second name, and I was going to say drop or something, but fantasy dirt. That's uh, that's perfect. Yeah. So. Uh, Let's let's just go backwards. How did you okay. how did you get here? How did you get to doing fantasy analysis, doing a show every day on on Sirius? Yeah, it's a long and circuitous route. Um, I um, obviously didn't play football. Um, <laughs> well, that's not <laughs> obvious now, right? If I was about mm, 15, 20 years younger, that would not be obvious. But I think for my age range, which is much younger than you're probably thinking right now. Um, I did not play football. So, uh, the fact that I ended up in the football space is, um, very interesting, I think. But, uh, but also I think there are some parallels there about that have been helpful, but the fact that I didn't play and feeling that, um, sense of like needing to prove yourself all the time and insecurity in different rooms and stuff, uh, that I think a lot of us deal with, but I think it's actually, I found a way to make it work for me. Um, 25 30 years down the road um yeah i just wanted to be in uh broadcasting i loved sports it was one of the things that when i was in like high school i would end up in conversations with um and again i said i didn't i didn't really play sports i wasn't i didn't grow up playing a bunch of sports but my dad was always my brother's coach and so there was a lot of sports on in our household a lot of talk about it i spent a lot of time at practices and games and i kind of um, got into it, um, fell in love with his after school activity more than mine, I guess is how I say it. Um, and so there were times in high school when I would find myself in conversation with some of the guys in like my math class, you know, where we'd be looking at the box score as you're supposed to do in math class. I don't know why I was looking at a newspaper and looking at box scores, <laughs> but we were, and I would engage with them in these conversations and they always had this shocked look on their face that I could hang. And that's my personality is like, oh, you don't think I can do this? Well, I'm going to do this to the nth degree. Like I'm going to go hard. I'm going to lean into that space. I'm going to be all the things that you don't think that I am um, to prove you wrong. And so that really was kind of how I got started 
going down this road was like, I kind of see that I feel like a uh, sort of an anomaly in some ways. And um, it's funny that I would make a business decision that early because I'm the least entrepreneurial business minded person that you've ever met. But it was kind of like, how can I stand out? How can I find um, a, a, um, a career avenue where I can potentially maybe like have a bit of an advantage? And that is what stood out to me in that sense. So I started doing broadcast journalism internships the second I stepped on campus at USC um, that were all sports related and then kind of did like the small market route um, and then, you know, ended up working for the regional sports network and then NFL network. And after a period of time, um, and a national pandemic, they decided that they didn't need me in my paycheck anymore. And so, uh, the last three years since then have actually been, um, I think some of the biggest growth, like the biggest growth period of my career. Like I can say with certainty and not like, in a bragging sort of way or anything, I'm way better at this than I ever have been before because it forced me to lean into some, um, like, what do I think about things and what are my opinions? Because broadcasting historically, especially when I got into the game was kind of big J journalism. Like you are not the story. Um, what you think doesn't matter. Like go in with a blank slate and ask the questions and be a journalist. And over time, I think we can all agree that to a degree that's gone away. They don't want somebody that's just vanilla up there um, giving them sports conversation. They want people who can engage in the sports conversation, not just ask questions and get you to break. And most of my career was that. It was kind of traffic coughing. So in the last three years, having to figure out like, what do I think? And how do I artic articulate those things? And how to talk without a net of a structure of a rundown and somebody to ask their, you know, just constantly like interview um, has become really um, a, a big growth period for me. And the fantasy thing has kind of been a, um, a jump off from that. Like I have strong opinions, you know, and I yeah. have gotten to the point where I've been in this space enough and have had converse, enough conversations with people who do feel comfortable articulating their opinions. And I realize they don't know anything more about this than I do in a lot of those conversations. And so I think I've gotten to a point where I am, I'm like, I, I'm fine. I, I have an opinion and I will bring that to the table and let's go. Yeah, that's a big, I mean, that, that's honestly a big point about, uh, I, you know, I get a lot of questions about people like, hey, how do I do the data science stuff? Like, how do I get into sports analytics? And like, brother, the internet's here, brother or sister, the internet's here. You can, mm -hmm. you can do that tomorrow. You can start posting and start making questions or asking questions and realizing that the confidence is a lot of it. I think there's a couple of times kind of early because I'm, I'm very similar. 2020, I was like, hey, I think I'm going to do something different, kind of steered into the football stuff. And, 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 and so I absolutely can empathize. But, um, you know, a couple moments you, you disagree with someone and think, oh, no, did I like, I have an opinion about this and they have a different opinion and then it was right. And you think, wait, no, I can form my own opinion and be right about things. And that's like, you can originate and come up with content is, is certainly a, a, a big turning point in kind of anyone's uh, career. I think understanding, like, I don't have to need, I don't, I don't need the validation of, you know, as somebody else, I can, I can, I can come up with that content um, myself. So how, how long has the fantasy uh, football stuff kind of been going for you? When did you really start to dive in on, on that? I mean, I, I am definitely someone that if I'm going to do something, I want to be good at it. That, that's my personality, right? And um, I have a lot of insecurities around not showing up well for anything. And so if I'm going to do a fantasy team out of the gate, I was like, I'm going to do this right. And I do think that one of the things that I bring to the table that's a little bit different does stem from the fact that I always felt like I had to prove myself and also that I wasn't an actual football player. I could never rely on the fact that like, oh, I've got all the answers to this. Like I always knew I never had all the answers, you know, especially earlier on in my career, I had to rely on what other people thought and just gather information. And I'm intellectually curious enough about all of this that I think that that worked, but also I'm um, questioning of everything, you know, like I'm it, just because you give me an opinion, I'm not going to assume that your opinion is right. I'm going to ask some follow up questions and dig a little bit over here. And um, so anyway, with regard to the fantasy stuff, uh, I started playing fantasy when I was at NFL Network early on in my time there. Um, it doesn't stem back any further than that, but it was more of a way to kind of get to know the depth of the league. You know, I think uh, I'm, I'm a strong proponent of people who are fantasy analysts oftentimes can talk football with anybody or like there's some of the best analysts out there period and that's another sidebar is like there's the data silo uh data scientist silo and there's the fantasy silo and there's all these different silos 
they they can all talk football with the best of them, right? Like they just come at it through a different prism because in order to have success in fantasy, you're running all of those numbers. You're looking for where the edge is. You're looking for a way that you're looking for a way that you can be a first predictor. Um, but also you have to know the league front and back. You got to know who the number three wide receiver is on every single team. You got to know who that running back is that's buried on the depth chart, who you think has a chance to rise. Cause that's what you're betting on ultimately, if you're playing fantasy football correctly. So um, first and foremost, for me, it was just a way to be engaged in the, the league across the board and have those names in front of me regularly as I was having those conversations on NFL network. And then over time, I just really started liking it. And so I would add a few more teams here and there. And now that I'm doing the fantasy show, I have way too many teams, which changes the way that you play fantasy football. Like you're probably a little bit more of a game theory person when you approach your lineups. And I am not that, but I'm being pulled in that direction. I'm kind of like, this is what I actually believe, but I'm going to get a couple of shares of this other thing in case I'm wrong to hedge over here but Sundays are like I don't even know what to root for you know because I got everything yeah. <laughs> and I'm also playing against all of those same people but uh, but yeah it really kind of blew up for me in the last few years when I started doing the fantasy show and wanting to be the best possible version of that I started looking in all of these different places and consuming as much content as I could and trying to like put it through my prism of like what do I think of that and um, how does it pertain to fantasy yeah, um, I, and I um, am, am super interested in that. You, you said that uh, sometimes the fantasy people are, are, are the best analysts, and I can I can say that's true in college. I'm much more of a college centric guy than an NFL guy. And you know, this summer I did a couple a couple hits and talked to a couple guys that I follow, and they're like, "Hey, I think this guy's going to be RB three for San Diego State." And I'm like, "Brother, I do not have an opinion on that. That is that is impressive. Like, way to go there." And uh, kind of He's a kind 18. of a fine line between. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know. Did he go to prom? I'm not sure if that affects his uh, his rushing this this fall or not who knows um yeah so that kind of answered a question you did a great great segue there into it is why, why do we like fantasy in it and and i tend to believe that that the biggest draw of fantasy for me is that it gives you uh kind of um extracurriculars to root for one yeah. uh you know that are like hey i can get invested in this guy's storyline i can buy back uh, i know i always loved fantasy baseball we have like a, a full minor league roster and you can root for a guy and be like yep this prospect is going to make it and he can he can come up and, and and lead my team and so that's 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 always fun as well um i also think that it can help us understand football more i think that's absolutely. a two-sided a double a double-edged sword right because i do think that like fantasy brain absolutely affects some people and how they analyze, but can you talk a little bit about the balance between how it helps us and how it might help hurt us? Yeah. Well, it hurts us because we forget about defense, right? Like aside from <laughs> this defense allows a lot of fantasy points. Like you pull up the fantasy apps and you see a big red three or a big green, you know, I, I don't even know if I just did that right. Yes. I like 32 or something. So um, you, you think of the defenses in that sense. And I think that uh, you can kind of lose sight of who all of the people are outside of those lockdown corners that maybe you might want to avoid in fantasy. And I know that that is true for me. I find myself having so many offensive conversations that I'm not as good. I have to specifically take myself out of a fantasy conversation, have a different conversation with people who are really keyed into different um, teams or like a defensive mindset or just watch a lot of tape and stuff like that who can kind of point me in the right direction of defenses that are on the rise. Um, also defense, as you know, so volatile. So it just feels like it's a tough thing to track from a predictive standpoint. But I think that's one of the ways that it it hurts us. Um, one of the ways I think it I think it helps the game broadly. And that's not answering your question about how it helps us. But it, it I think it's there's no doubt that fantasy football is one of the best things that happened to the NFL and to football in general, but specifically the NFL. And I think one of the things that you find is that, I mean, people grow up in certain cities and they are fans of that team, but they also are a fan of all 32 teams in terms of consuming information because they have this guy on their fantasy roster. Or they're going up against that guy or they're keeping an eye on this guy over here for a waiver wire ad like this sport more than any other, I think has just a broad blanket fandom as opposed to one rabid fan base. And I think that that's one of the things that I really struggled with at times um, at NFL network was because there are certain teams that certainly uh, move the needle a little bit more and you know which ones they are and you hear about them more frequently on your television and you're not making it up in your mind. You're a hundred percent hearing about those teams more because their fan bases move the needle. They tune in, 
they're rabid, there are other fan bases that aren't as large. And so they're not catered to in that sense. My argument was always like, that's not true. You could say that the Jacksonville Jaguars maybe don't have the biggest fan base, but people are still interested if they're good and they're putting up points offensively. Everyone is interested in hearing about um, ETN or, you know, and this is changing obviously because Trevor Lawrence and the offense, they're just a better team. So this is going to pivot in a different direction, but still I bet you don't hear about them that much on television because uh, they have a small fan base. And so I would always push back and say like, People are still interested in all of those things. If you talk about the things that they're doing well, that that helps them in their fantasy team, helps them set their rosters, and it also helps them make the bets that they want to bet. Like people come to this NFL space with a whole bunch of different um, driving forces. It's not just because their dad raised them sitting on the TV watching the Steelers games. It's not just that. That might be part of it, but there's a lot more to the story these days. And so um, I think fantasy football is massive for the league. Um, and I think, uh, for the individual, I think it, it creates people who play fantasy end up being smarter football fans. They just are because you have to be in order to keep up. Even if you're somebody that's just like doing it for fun and casual, and you're the person in the league that's picking them. Like my mother-in-law, we did a, a family and friends dynasty league this year, and she doesn't know anything about anything. And she was like, I'm going to pick the person who has the kindest face, but by the end of the year, she's going to be different. My son is nine. Um, he's in fourth grade. I did a league for his friends last year that I was the commissioner of. By the end of the year, the names that were coming out of their mouths, and they didn't know anything at the start of the season. They were drafting like they were, it's comedy. They would draft people, and I did not laugh. I was like, that's a bad pick. You know, mm, you want two quarterbacks in the first four rounds. Okay, that's an interesting strategy in a non super flex league. But then by the end of the year, they've completely pivoted. They're so immersed in this space and they know everybody because they're scanning the waiver wire and they're competitive and that's driving their fandom. Yeah, which is which is super cool, that kind of more surface area for the fans to engage and a lot of entry points for people who might not otherwise care about it. Or if your team's, you know, your 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 rooting interest team is is bad, you can find something else to root for, certainly there. Um, what kind of leagues do you find yourself most in? I know we we at Sumer have been doing uh without spoiling anything, been doing a little bit of work in fantasy, focusing a little bit on best ball mostly yeah. as kind of a starting point. What uh what do you find yourself playing most? The ultimate game theory. How many best ball rosters did you put together? I bet it's like a hundred or something. I don't know if I'm legally allowed to answer that question on air okay. right now. So okay. Eric right. will get mad at me. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't want you to get in trouble with eager um, for sure. But I mean, yeah. So, so there's a, obviously a lot of math that could go into something like that. I tend to approach it a little bit differently just because my, my, I joke that like the left side of my brain just never, um, never formed. So I am much more um, right brain and, and I, am the person who's like uh desperately wants the um data science people to like be my friend um like because that's that's the aspect of my personality and my strengths and weaknesses that never developed and so i'm like please i want i want in this to the smart circle um but for me it's i i play fantasy and um if i do best ball i will only do enough to just have an, enough swings at it to be able to talk about adps um but i'm not thinking uh, about mathematical strategy personally, I'm doing what I think is likely to happen. And I'm wanting to get some exposure to various um, avenues um, that I feel strongly about, but that's it. Um, in terms of DFS, I like doing small field. I like doing like small tournaments. I like doing single entry so that then I'm not playing against somebody where their strengths of just being able to do the math quickly that, that takes over my um, analysis. So I'm doing some of those every week, um, just because I think it's fun. Um, and I'm playing a lot of redraft, a lot of different formats, um, have a few dynasty leagues, a little bit of everything. I like, you know, doing like a Scott fishbowl where the scoring is totally different. I like doing some of the, um, some of the fantasy cares eliminator leagues because they just tweak the scoring and you have to reframe like what this means in terms of who is valuable but i don't like doing too many of those because then i find that i'm not really ready once it's time to draft i want to just you know uh, i want a little bit of exposure to all of the different formats what i don't do is idp um and that's 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 one i don't have on my roster that i know a lot of people talk up and say is is really really fun but i just i think me personally i don't have the bandwidth to add defensive players to it yet 
what does off season prep look like for you? When is when does the fantasy for you? When does the fantasy off season kind of stop? And and when do you? Uh, it never you, how do you prep stops. for a season. <laughs> well, so the fantasy season probably stops, but for me, one of my favorite times of the year, taking myself out of the fantasy space and just in terms of NFL analysis, I um, love roster building. I love it. I love the concept of what worked last year, what didn't work last year, how can we tweak it, what makes sense, um, and you know, how should we approach the draft, how do we use the capital that we have, how do we gain more capital, all the stuff that you guys are doing such a good job of trying to figure out for teams at Sumer in terms of roster management. Um, this is one of the things that I think is so fascinating. And that also kind of does tie to fantasy because I think that's what a lot of us are trying to do in with our fantasy rosters, right? It's very different, but you're trying to figure out uh, the narrative that you believe in, the people that you believe in, um, the usage that you think is likely to be there. And you're sort of planting your flag and then drafting a team and then hoping that it goes in the direction that you think it's going to go. Um, the off season is one of my favorite times of year, just because it's all that it's all roster building. It's all draft and free agency and salary cap and new contracts and all of that stuff. I, I just, I'm way into that. So for me, there really is no dead period of the off season because I'm so into that part of the off season. Um, there's like a week and a half, right. In like June and July, the beginning of July, where you can kind of check out for a hot minute. But for the most part, it's just constantly tracking all of the information that's coming out, uh, what people are saying. Um, this is where I think my my journalism background and just having been in a lot of different conversations over so many years um, at NFL Network and just uh, even before that as just a sports broadcaster doing different sports, kind of figuring out how to read between the lines and um, how to edit the information that's out there and what you think is important. And, um, and that's a fun game too. Like he's saying this, like, for instance, this week, this is my new thing that I'm on and I might be wrong, but Jaleel McLaughlin, McLaughlin in Denver, who was an undrafted running back, um, who worked his way up to third on the depth chart there. Now, obviously they have Javante Williams and they have some AJP right. And those are the priority backs there, but clearly he's good. Clearly he popped enough that he rose up the depth chart like that. And then, uh, one of the beat writers put out today um, that they were talking to Sean Payton and this I think was just offered by Sean Payton. Like, what do you, what are you prioritizing um, in terms of things that you want to be most different? And he said that he wanted uh, Julia McLaughlin to be, he said, it seemed like a, the beat writers quote said, it seemed like one of the things he and the offensive coaching staff wanted to change about the Raiders game was getting more touches for Julio McLaughlin. The quote, we'll find those touches for him. I think that'll be important when things like that are offered. Like if you're like, Hey, what, what, what do you most want to change? What most didn't go your way. And that's where you go. I think that's notable. And so I was telling people in fantasy today on fantasy, Dirt, like go get him. Like if you have room on your bench, like don't like, don't put him in and, you know, start him over Joe Mixon or anything stupid like that. But, you know, just stash him. Keep an eye. Because I think when coaches offer that kind of information, it means something. And so I think um, partially that's what my whole year is, is it's trying to take in all this information and then also track what is being said, what I think is important, what's trying to push us in a different direction to, to throw us off the scent and trying to accumulate, um, you know, my opinions that way moving forward. Yeah. And how do you, uh, kind of an adjacent question here, how, how do you balance between trying to find that edge and say, hey, let's go get McLaughlin because we think this is going to be here and not overreacting in a way that might be detrimental to kind of your week to week team. And I know uh, open question. If you had the answer to that would be no. sitting on a beach somewhere. A hundred percent. I think I think you have to be able to look at your roster and know what you can absorb because your whole the, the whole back half of your draft, for instance, can't be all upside players. It has to be like a player here or there that you know I don't actually think this person's particularly talented or um, this ceiling isn't going to be very high, but this person's going to be on the field a ton. This is not a dart throw, right? So maybe in some cases, um, although this is probably a bad example, like Adam Thielen is somebody, and it, it's a bad example after week one because wh what happened? But in the preseason, his target share and his snap share and his like air yard share, all of that, the target share and air yard share 
oftentimes are predictive in terms of like how high is it? That's where you are prioritized in the offense. And so regardless of what we think of your skill set, which I don't think Adam Thielen's that dude anymore. I don't want any part of him on my fantasy roster until I started seeing those numbers. And then I was like, that that those are elite numbers. And that doesn't mean that that will continue. And this was obviously with the starters and not, you know, uh, everything. But but I went out and I drafted a couple of Adam Thielen shares towards the bottom half. Cause at that point you're just, you're just, it's all, it's all a dart throw. I think some of those have to be um, people that maybe don't have the ceiling, but they're, I mean, but in that case, maybe he does have a ceiling, right? Like if those numbers were to continue, maybe he's just going to outplay what we're all expecting. Um, I think you have to play it a little bit safer and then go get some guys that, you know, are, like, like a tank Dell, like maybe some people are getting a Robert Woods on one team. And then on the next team, they're getting a tank Dell and assuming that Robert Woods is probably going to have a high target volume tank Dell. I don't know, but by the end of the season, I think that the talent will uh, take him to the top of the depth chart on a team that's going to need somebody to step up. And, but you just can't, you can't make your whole roster a bunch of dart throws like that. It can't be all rookie upsides because that's one of the things I have learned over the years. I do get enamored. We all get enamored with those names at the bottom of the draft and you have to, you can't create a whole roster where like you have your starters and then a whole bunch of people on the bench that never hit. That, and that is interesting to me from the fantasy side point uh, or standpoint of things, because I think it parallels a lot of like online football analysis as well. I think about this specific example of, um, someone screenshotting like a quarterback's read and being like, why didn't he throw to this guy? This guy was wide open and you're not, you can't do that. That's not how this works. Like there's a read progression. There's a difference between intent and execution. And yeah. I think that looking at opportunity to try to project forward shares for a fantasy football player is trying to divine out a little bit. Okay. What was the intent here? Did he get the opportunity? And then what was the execution? Did he capitalize on the opportunity? And you've got to separate that into another quadrant as well as, is he making most of those opportunities? Is he making less and kind of separate out those players based on kind of not just yep. what they did, but what they were supposed to do as well. A hundred percent. And like, uh, one of the people that popped in week one in all of those different ways was Zay Flowers. I think for a lot of people, a lot of people drafted him in a round where you probably put him on your bench um, to keep an eye on him. At, but you, you know, he was like right there teetering on the edge of potentially being a flex player or something like that in week one. And then his usage was crazy. I mean, number one in the NFL in target share in week one as a rookie. I mean, we're talking 45.5% 10 of Lamar's 22 pass attempts go to him in a year where you're talking about passing the ball more and have all off season to formulate what your approach is going to be. So I think that that's, I think that that tells us a lot about what they think of Zay Flowers and also his first read rate, which was number one in the NFL, 60%. So they have all off season to design some plays and who is Lamar looking to first more frequently, like by a lot, like number one in the NFL, that first read rate, a rookie, Zay Flowers. So in this room that felt very, like, we don't know what the hierarchy is. Everyone kept saying we'd have people on our fantasy show and they're like, I don't know, Zay Flowers could be the fourth best wide receiver at the end of the year. And I would be, um, I wouldn't be surprised. He could be number one. It could be any part of this. It could be Rashad, OBJ, like throw the names up in the air and they could settle in whatever order. And I thought I'm going to bet on Zay because the upside is there. OBJ saying that he thinks he has the skill set to be a top five receiver in this league. I think that there's something to that, right? Like we hear people talk up their teammates all the time, but that's a very specific talk up. That's a very specific, I'm putting him in conversation and I know who that, what that means. And I'm going to do it anyway, because I think that that's what I'm seeing on the field and that married to the numbers and then not just usage, but then he averaged nearly six yards after the catch, which led all receivers. Uh, no, that didn't. Uh, he led all receivers with six missed tackles forced. Jamar Chase second with three, half his total. Like Zay Flowers played good football and was a priority in an offense that we didn't otherwise know who the priority was going into last week. So for me, Zay Flowers, that's one of the biggest things that I learned in week one because the data, the narrative, all of the things kind of come together to point us right there. Who, uh, who else among, uh, especially rookies, I think, who else that might be a little undervalued are you kind of crushing on in terms of a fantasy I mean, right now? Puka, Puka. It's and I know, not to. I know, but par part of this is okay. So all off season when, 
um, I would read stories about the Rams and not like Jordan Rodriguez, I think is one of the best beat writers that's out there. She's so curious and she asks such smart questions. And um, I, I think, I think she's, she's not at all lazy. Like some people are lazy and they just pass along their observations. She's clearly going to everyone and, and um, asking a ton of different people, a ton of different questions. So I think that she's a very good beat writer. And when she points out that Puku Nakua is involved in packages that rookies typically aren't. It's not just like when you're when you're when you're trying to figure out what matters and what doesn't matter in the preseason and in training camp. It's the athletic um, tweets where like, look at that one handed grab, right? Like, but that could be a one off. Like George Pickens, I think, is a perfect example of that as a guy who we all think narratively is one of the best wide receivers in the NFL. But then you go to a place like Reception Perception, who's charting him, and he's like, no, he's like kind of kind of a one-trick pony. His routes are a little bit sloppy. Like, I don't know if he's where he's supposed to be, when he's supposed to be there with that much frequency. This is something he needs to work on heading into this year. Uh, noted that apparently everybody in Pittsburgh said that he did that in this offseason. So that's something I'm looking for this year. But athleticism isn't the only thing you're looking for. You're looking for the things like they're putting, what packages are they putting him in? Um, when they go to, um, you know, uh, 11 personnel, is he like, who who's on the field? Who are the guys who are on the field who have worked their way into regular roles? Um, Pukunuku was one of those guys all off season. The thing, the only problem that we had was we didn't know if that was because they were so bad that they just had to use someone, but it looks like, um, he might actually be good. And so I think he was definitely someone that was on my radar in drafts where I was like, in those last couple of rounds, I'm going to take Pukunuku shots here and there. And a lot of times I wasn't able to get him because I'm in a lot of industry drafts where everyone's kind of same brained, like you can't sneak one by people. But I tried to as much as I possibly could because um, I thought that this possibly could happen because the ways in which he was elevating, like when you're an unknown kind of and you're not getting any of that buzz coming in to the NFL, coming out of the draft, and then the coaches are enamored with you. That's a different story than if you're a first round draft pick and we're hearing that you're doing great and they love you, right? Like that's what they're supposed right. to say in that situation. Here, they're saying it because they want to say it because he really is popping because they they really do like what they're seeing. So I think that there's a lot from Puka Nakua's game. Um, obviously, you know, the value maybe goes down when, not maybe, it goes down when Cooper Cup comes back. He's not going to um, uh, be... Uh, sixth in the NFL in first read rate. I'll tell you that he's not going to be second in target share. Um, that's not going to happen. But I think that um, all the underlying metrics also say that he did well, that it wasn't just like, Hey, we're going to force feed this guy and come hell or high water, whatever happens. You know, I think they think he's good. And so I think that, I think that matters. Yeah, absolutely. And I like that kind of deciphering what they're saying and why they're saying it matters so much. That gives you another edge. And again, another way to test hypotheses about what's going to happen on the field. That That's what, what fantasy does for us there. I've heard you mention target share. I've heard you mention air yards. I've heard you mention first read rate. What are a couple other kind of stats you're looking at? I know those are all very wide receiver centric, maybe for some yeah. quarterbacks and, ride, and running backs. Don't give away any state secrets, but generally no, when I mean, you're evaluating some of these guys, what are you looking for for running backs and quarterbacks kind of stat wise? Well, and I'd be interested to hear from you what I should be looking for. Cause what I am looking for, like with regard to running backs, a lot of times I'm looking at rushing yards over expectation because that stat is supposed to keep in mind what is supposed to happen on the play taking consideration all of the other factors right so the blockers where they were all of that stuff rate of speed at handoff all of these different things are supposed to be factored into that number so you're not just saying like hey before the game we thought you were going to rush for 100 yards like, out of thin air but you didn't uh that's not how they're coming up with the number so i think that that is a somewhat telling um statistic i'm looking at things like miss tackles forced um, yards after contact, because obviously then that is an athletic subset that you want to see. You want to see people who, when the defender does touch them, do they have like some wiggle? Do they have that slipperiness? Are they able to create something afterward? So that feels like it's, you can take it out of the circumstance. Like if the circumstance is bad, are you going to make more out of that? Um, I said, miss tackles forced some of those. Oh, uh, one this week that popped for me with Deion Jackson that is not one that I'm typically looking for is yards before. Wait, where? Hold on, hold on, hold, please. Well, I, don't, oh, I think I saw this tweet of yours yards before contact where it was negative for Deion Jackson. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So 
yards before contact for him negative 0.46 in week one. This dude <laughs> couldn't even get to the line of scrimmage without a defender being on top of him. So for me, that's not necessarily that's that tells you that the story isn't just him. It's not just his talent level. Like that tells me that something went wrong with the O line. And maybe we need to look into this further. We need to ask more questions, but that number pops like that's bad. And that tells you that when his um, expected fantasy points are like the third highest number in the league, based on his usage, it's 18. That, that was a true stat this week that based on his usage, his expected fantasy points should have been number three in the NFL. Instead, he had like five fantasy points. He didn't do anything with it, but he was in a bad situation. So I not just thinking about Deion Jackson, but I'm thinking of Jonathan Taylor. When Jonathan Taylor comes back, that's his situation. That's his environment that he's going to be playing in. Now let's go back and look at like his missed tackles for uh, and and those kinds of numbers. What does he do when this situation is like that? Is he more slippery? That's one of the, the reasons I'm looking at Zach Moss this week. He has a little bit more of a history in terms of being able to break tackles and create some yards. So if we're looking, this is just a bad offensive line, or this is a bad set of circumstances for you. Bummer for you, Dion, but this isn't your strength, right? Like, so maybe Zach, his strength will just lead to a few more yards in this admittedly bad situation. And then Jonathan Taylor. But again, I'm like, I don't have any shares of Jonathan Taylor this year. And it's because, um, it's because I think the, it, everything was bad last year. And one of my concerns going into this year is, yeah, he might be the guy from a couple of years ago that 100% might happen, but that's a bet too. You're gambling on that. And what I haven't heard all year is, how did they upgrade that offensive line? That offensive line could be way better. Didn't hear it. Like, no, like we're just assuming that the that the whole, I mean, Anthony Richardson, I love, like we get into that. But, but in terms of the things that are going to make Jonathan Taylor's life a whole lot better, I don't know. Plus Anthony uh, Richardson, are we, is he going to vulture touchdowns from him at the goal line? And then his fantasy points plummet. I'm one of those people that's like, look, if I'm not feeling this gamble, I will leave him to you and I will let you gamble on this guy. And I'll be totally fine if it hits, but I am always going to go with my gut. And in a certain range at ADP, you're making a choice between him and someone else. That's also very good. So I don't necessarily, I'm not hearing what I would like to hear. I think the floor that we saw last year from Jonathan Taylor is a possible floor again this year. And it might not be, but congratulations if you draft him and it's not, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to make that gamble. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, and, and, and there is something there that's, that's uh, almost, you can't empirically measure it about the gravity of Richardson or running quarterback and kind of how much a quarterback runs versus how many designed runs you get from a running back that might affect that volume as well. Um, I, I like, uh, I like looking at a breakaway rate too. I know in college, uh, that's going to be a little bit more predictive, but just, Hey, when you, when you get a big one, how big is like, how often do you get the big one? And then how big is the big one when you break it off? Cause I think those kind of tail events in fantasy are so important. You know, do you have a guy who can get you that big chunk of yards and, and really, um, kind of body up your uh, bolster, bolster your score there. Uh, what about quarterbacks? Uh, a couple of metrics you like, maybe a couple, uh, a quarterback or two, you've got some exposure to that might be, uh, kind of against the grain. Um, I did, I did, I don't know about metrics. I like, I like EPA and some of that stuff in season, but I have also been told, and you would note that I, I've been told that that's not necessarily um, predictive from year to year. So that uh, it's more like an in-season type thing or a reflection yeah. of what actually happened in the game. And it allows you to judge. Um, I, I don't even know why I'm telling. Why Why am I explaining this to you? I mean, it's, I feel it's like It's good to should. say true things out loud. I'm very okay with that. Yeah, I, I think that's a good attitude to have towards it. It's a lot more descriptive than... than um, than predictive and you got to adjust it a little bit to make it sticky year over year. There you go. Sticky. I love that. These phrases that you guys use that I just like, I'm <laughs> like, I'm going to take it. I'm going to use it in my vocabulary and people are going to think that I'm smart too. Um, but yes, uh, I, I think one of the things that I'm in on, and this is a total fantasy lean is the Anthony Richardson. This is m one of my flag plans this off season was like, I think, and I'm not doing this all the time, but I think you can wait. I think you can wait and you can get Anthony Richardson. And I would, if you miss out on one of the top quarterbacks, I was like, wait, a hundred percent. Don't, don't go, don't draft Kirk cousins. Like, are you going to win a fantasy league with cause maybe, maybe if everything else, but I mean, you're getting him, you're taking him probably around the same time as you're taking Anthony Richardson. Anthony Richardson has um, the range of outcomes is such where like 
I mean, he, it could bust. It could be Justin Fields in year one where like they don't run him or something, but like clearly they weren't drafting him in Indianapolis for that. And everything that they've said, and this goes again to reading between the lines and listening to the things that they're saying, the fact that they made him the starter right out of the gate, committed to it. We're not bringing him along. We know we're in for a roller coaster. Everything about him says this is going to be a roller coaster. He needs some development. There's a certain element of rawness that doesn't exist for the other quarterbacks, but there's also a ceiling that doesn't exist for the other quarterbacks because he brings an element to the game that Bryce Young and CJ Stroud aren't bringing. And that's obviously um, his ability on the ground. Uh, and also the arm, the arm's a monster arm, but you just kind of know, you know, it's going to go like this, this year, that it's going to be gross. Sometimes he's going to make egregious mistakes, but then he's going to make plays that are like, what just happened? And I think the fact that they signed up for that out of the gate was smart because you're not going anywhere this year. Anyway, just get him that experience, get him those reps, help him work through some of those things early so that we get to where we want to go faster. Gardner Minshew is not taking you to the Super Bowl. You don't have a roster that's going to the Super Bowl. So let's just go. Let's grow. Let's get a read on Anthony Richardson yeah. by the end of the year so we can build a team around him or not, right? Like, let's get our answer faster. So, but from a fantasy standpoint, he can be a bad quarterback and still be a great fantasy quarterback. And we saw that with Justin Fields uh, in the second half of the season last year. When they started running him and God knows why it took so long for Chicago to be like, you know, what's he good at? Uh, there are a lot of things that we don't think we know if he's good at, but he's really tough to stop when he runs. Like, just do that. Like, do that more frequently. Have some design runs in there. Lean into his strengths and allow him to have some success while you work on the things that are not his strengths. Don't get me started. Anyway, Anthony Richardson, <laughs> I believed based on what yeah. they were saying this year that they understood what they were doing with him and that they were going to um, handle him correctly, which to me I says fantasy, when, very high floor and the ceiling is the roof. To yeah, quote Michael absolutely. I, I think back when there was like we were at the peak of kind of that uh, Richardson Levis nonsensical discourse this <laughs> offseason. Uh, I think what I treated was one, in addition to multiple Matrix uh, pill uh, memes about which one you should take there. Uh, I said that you... I, if I'm a GM, I'd rather go down drafting Richardson than drafting Levis. Like I think, and that's very 100%. true with fantasy as well. You look at that and you think, I, I, I'm going to take this guy. Like there's no reason. The market fundamentals are there. He's got the production. They're going to stick with him. There's no chance he gets benched. And uh, and yeah, so so I, I like that one a whole lot. Can I add another rookie quarterback to this conversation please. in a timely, ask, timely news sort of fashion? Okay. How about DTR to the Jets? Dude, he looked great in the preseason. He spent four years with a Chip Kelly offense. He learned a lot, got a lot of looks, has a big brain for the big playbook. And I mean, not just the gritty stuff I want to see where like in the preseason, he's running, he's blocking and doing all that. He looked good. He looked legitimately good. Mm -hmm. I don't hate that at all. That, I, I, as, a, as a Titans fan, I want it to be Tannehill. But I get, I, I think DTR would be a really good. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not going to be Tannehill. See, that's the I, other <laughs> thing, though. That's the other thing, though, that like that I keep hearing this week. People are like, I mean, a call to Matt Ryan is not. I'm like, why? Why? Like, what are we doing here? What are you trying to do? Like, that's not, it's not, you're not going to win a Super Bowl with, you know, any of these um, like retread names that we've, and that's not, I don't mean that um, disrespectfully, like, but we're at a point where like, he couldn't, he couldn't, it was awful in Indy, you know, and Indy was a bad situation. I get that it's different, but like, don't do that. No, go get somebody where there's a ceiling. Go get somebody who, if it hits, holy moly, we got something here. And if it doesn't, then what? Like no, no sweat. Like, what are you doing this year anyway? You know, so go develop something like that. And clearly DTR is not getting on the field anytime soon, unless Deshaun Watson gets hurt um, because they're so all in financially on Deshaun Watson. But I mean, I just, I, I really like him. And I know that this is not something like in an analytics conversation, you're going to be like, gross. Um, I did a, <laughs> well, it's like the thing you can't, the, the intangible that you cannot actually, um, measure uh I just I think he's a guy who is a good locker room guy I think he's a guy who especially even as a rookie goes into a situation and people love him I think they love him I think they want to play with him I did a um a flag football game in the offseason that was down in Orange County that Aaron Rodgers was at 
and uh, Josh Allen. And there were a bunch of like big name quarterbacks that were there. And again, it's flag football and you're playing with like celebrities and whatever. It's not like real, you know, DTR was a guy that was like rallying his troops every single time his team went (laughs) way further than it should have gone. And I just loved the intangibles that he brought to the table in terms of like how he's chest bumping the guys and like they were feeding off of him. And I thought this is super interesting to me. There's something happening over here that draws you in as opposed to pulls you, pushes you away. And I think that there's something to that in a position like the quarterback position that's so leadership driven. And, and then that coupled with the fact that he had so much success in the preseason. I was like, I think that this actually, if he sees the field, I, I think I'm in, I'm buying, I'm buying shares of DTR. And so I've heard all these gross names in the jets conversation this week. And then I can't remember who said it. I want to give them credit. Someone said DTR. And I was like, that's it done period. Like that's the one I want. The I'll jets be disappointed would, if it's not him. Love it. Yeah, the Jets, the Jets would absolutely love it. I was laughing about what was it, Vinny Testaverde at like 44. They called him and signed him in October and he came in and won a game. Uh, I don't know that Matt Ryan's gonna be able to gonna be able to pull that off in the same in the same way. Um, although he's certainly not 44 years old. Uh Lindsay, looking at the time, we are we are at that 45 minutes. And so I have uh, enjoyed this conversation so much. Could talk more. Absolutely gonna have to have you back on to uh to to check in mid-season and uh and talk about this. Where can people uh, find you, follow you, uh, listen to your thoughts and opinions. Uh, so again, it's fantasy dirt on Sirius X and fantasy sports radio. That's channel 87. Um, and it's Monday through Friday, one to 3 PM Eastern. I'm there every day talking fantasy. Uh, I'm also on Twitter at Lindsay underscore Rhodes, Lindsay Rhodes NFL on Instagram. Those are the things. Yeah. Awesome. And I will be subscribing to the show and listening to you regularly. Love your work, Parker. Love your take on things. Um, You're so smart. And I'm um, very excited that I got to be on the show with you today. Yeah, well, thank you so much for being here for for the debut of uh, Odd Man Front. This has been uh, a Odd Man Front, a Sumer Sports podcast. Make sure you like the like the show, subscribe on YouTube, all that stuff. Share it with a friend who likes football, uh, and uh, help us get us to the people who would enjoy hearing this. And make sure you go sign up at sumersports.com backslash the zone. I'll see you next week.